once upon a time, in fact, not that very long ago, in the land of the long white cloud were two beautiful cities. Well, actually, it was only one city, split into two halves, right through the middle of that city, was a great water-filled chasm. The leaders loved their city and were sad that it was split in two. So they built a bridge for some of their citizens to use. As time went by, the city and the bridge grew and the ones that were allowed to use the bridge traveled happily across it every day. I did say only some of the citizens were allowed to use the bridge. It was a bridge for big wheels only, cars, trucks and buses. Anyone without a car needed to catch a bus across the bridge and over the chasm. The leaders always promised that small wheels and feet would be able to use the bridge in the future. Well, one day in 1974, just for a day, that promise came true. The drivers of the big wheel buses decided to go on strike. This meant that many people would be stuck either side of the chasm. The leaders remembered their promise and allowed the small wheels and feet to cross the bridge over the chasm and to the other side. Trevor was one of these lucky people. You could set your clock by the time Trevor left in the mornings. After a breakfast of porridge and two poached eggs on toast, he usually caught the bus across the bridge and over the chasm to work. But on this day, Trevor borrowed his nine-year-old daughter's bike, put bicycle clips on his suit trousers, popped his lunch in the basket, and set off as he rode past the waving road workers, as he said good morning to walk as he passed, to the people on bikes that came towards him. No petrol or battery power for Trevor as he rode along the 800 metre slope to the top, where he paused to take in a rather rainy view, then buttoned up his jacket, and <laughs> Trevor had a very gentle downhill ride all the way to the other side and into his office. Trevor loved his big day out on a bike. Many years passed, the city leaders forgot their promise to let small wheels and feet cross the bridge, leaving those without a car or a bus fare stuck on one side. But then, in 2016, something started to happen. The number of big wheels heading across the bridge and over the chasm every morning started to reduce. Fewer and fewer cars, but more and more buses, meant that for the very first time, there was less and less motor traffic. Not by much at first, but slowly, year by year, the numbers of big wheels went down. It went down so much that all those big wheels didn't need all of the bridge. There was room left to share, but the big wheels had gotten so used to having the bridge all to themselves, they didn't want to share, so they spread themselves out so that it looked far too busy to share with small wheels and feet. But of course, there was room. Room to share. Room to have seven lanes for big wheels and one shared lane, just a smidge of the bridge for the small wheels and feet. We love fairy stories. Auckland Harbour Bridge, as you probably know, operates with five lanes in each direction during the peak times. The graph you've just seen shows that certainly since COVID and um, for considerable time before that, uh, that could actually have only been accommodated with four lanes. So it would be possible without massively disrupting the traffic to put one active mode lane on the bridge. It's nothing special. It's a four metre wide shared path enough room for cyclists, scooters, and people to share. It's just a smidge of the bridge, as you can see, four lanes in one direction, three in the other, and a shared path. But the 
leaders said, ah, the bridge is far too steep for small wheels and feet. They had forgotten Trevor and the children that had already ridden over the bridge in the 2021 Liberate the Lane rally. They had forgotten that e-bikes and scooters have magic motors that make slopes disappear. They had forgotten that the city already had many longer and steeper paths for small wheels and feet. Auckland Harbour Bridge actually isn't that steep. It's, it's only 5%. Um, obviously, once all the finish work and all the tunnels are working, Wakatai are actually proposing to use it for walking and cycling anyway. It's also not steep compared to other parts. And with a shared path, anybody that's tempted to speed will be regulated by other users, peer pressure, signage, bylaws, and also bridge wardens, humans on the bridge to help people. Ambassadors for the bridge, guardians of the bridge. There's the path. I've doubled the scale just in case um, Simon Court's here, because he thought it was twice as steep as it actually is. Um, that's three other paths that are being built or have been built by Wakatahi uh, around the country. You can see the Auckland Harbour Bridge isn't too steep and isn't too long. But then the leaders said, ah, but how will the small wheels and feet be protected from big wheels? With a barrier. If you go to the CSP stand, they have a stunning barrier called the HV2. It's freestanding. Um, and under normal conditions, on a one-lane road with barriers either side, even a bus travelling 80 kilometres an hour would only move that barrier by actually under around half a metre, certainly less than three quarters of a metre, which means it's very unlikely that anybody is going to be on the shared path should that bus career into it at 80 kilometres an hour. Also remember that most 80 kilometres an hour roads in New Zealand have zero protection for people on the footpath. So this is actually a significantly upgraded facility than would be available in most places. But then the leaders said, ah, but that path is too narrow. People will bump into each other. People will get seriously hurt. Uh, maybe, uh, but the path that we're proposing is actually identical width to the one that Wakatahi already proposed. Um, it's not perfect. It would be great if it was a bit wider. But let's be realistic. Let's not let perfection get in the way of good. So it is something that can be provided safely. It meets all the requirements for capacity. It's got a capacity of something like 800 people an hour. The initial predictions are for only just over 1,000 people a day to use the structure, just under 1,000 people a day. So in reality, the path has got plenty of capacity. Then the leader said, it isn't safe. People could fall off. People could fall off. People could climb off. There is a lot of international evidence that providing good anti-climb provision can reduce attempted suicides by in excess of 50%. We're proposing a 2.1 metre high barrier. It's modelled on this barrier from Bristol in the UK. Uh, again, a, a very high suicide location. We're also talking about other provisions. Train staff monitor TV, a quiet room where people can move to be counselled. Significantly, this solution retains the view. On the traffic side, on top of the barrier, a simple mesh just to provide some protection from things being uh, coming off vehicles into the walkway and also a degree of visual screening. It's not perfect, but perhaps we don't need to get perfection like getting in the way of the good. Then the leaders cried. But it's too windy. Absolutely. The path would be closed on certain days when it is too windy, as the road is now. We're looking at putting the path on the east side. Most of the strong winds are coming from the west. Unexpected gusts are actually not as common as has been, has been spoken about. They generally come from the direction of the prevailing wind. There's all sorts of provisions you can put in so pedestrians and cyclists can see what the wind conditions are on the bridge. They're close by. They make the call about whether they want to go across the bridge or not. There'll be staff on the bridge so they can help people. And if it becomes too windy to cycle, those cyclists miraculously turn into pedestrians. And then they can walk through. 
it's only a 15, 20 minute walk at max across the bridge, about four or five minutes on a bicycle. Then the leaders whispered, but the bridge wobbles too much. You may well have seen coverage of the bridge swaying. It does sway when large numbers of walkers, and it has to be walkers, walk across. And we're talking in excess of a thousand walkers at any one time. And the clip on sways, and that little red gap there opens and closes. There's some good news. Wakatahi designed a solution 14 years ago. It's a lightweight solution, and it's obviously remote from the shared path. So the shared path with the barriers will be remote from that. Also, the forecast pedestrian walking usage on the bridge gets nowhere near the numbers required to start the bridge moving. Remember also, the bridge will be staffed. We still think that the sway should probably be sorted out as well, but that's another story. Then the leaders sighed. We just can't afford it, it can't be done forgetting that they had already said it could be done for $20 million and should be achievable in under a year. Will Trevor have to wait longer to relive his 1974 adventure? Will everyone be allowed to cross the bridge and over the chasm? Will the city be joined together for all? Will we live happily ever after? The answer is up to us all. Thank you.